Well, we are in what some of you uh, would say is your favorite series that we do every year. It is Preach This. Every July we do this. Um, and what happens is I throw out a topic, like this week I threw out a song. And you guys text in throughout the week, and I have to pick something and try and come up with a sermon in a week. And so we do songs, we do movies, we do different things. Some of y'all were texting me yesterday afternoon, like, come on. All right. <laughs> I've already worked on it by then. Like, you got to be a little quicker on this. Um, but uh, there's a new Lauren Daigle song coming out called Rescue. And I, I love it. Um, and, and I went with that for this week for this reason. One of my absolute favorite things about God is that our God is a God of rescue. I mean... All throughout the Bible, what you see in every place is just rescue story after rescue story. And God does it so much bigger and better than Hollywood could even imagine. I mean, Hollywood has nothing on God when it comes to the dramatic, amazing, and, and just incredible rescues that we see in the Bible. The Bible is literally filled with stories of rescue, of, of desperate people who, who are crying out and, and uh, just hopeless and, and about to be dead, and then God comes in and just does something incredible. And, you know, like, we love these stories. We, we love the stories of these last-minute heroic rescues. You know, every, every movie has these. You know, like, you see, um, like, someone trapped in a room or a car and in and, and the Hollywood movies, and, and the water's filling up to the very, very top, and they're breathing that last bit of air. And then what always happens? Like, a door opens, and all the water floods out, and they're safe. You know, it, it never opens when the water's at their knees, and they're fine. You know, it's like that last minute. Or, you know, like, there's that lone army guy, and he's fighting, like, 200 people, and they're closing in. And then all of a sudden, right when he's about to die, like, a plane comes out of nowhere and blows them all up, and everybody cheers, you know? Maybe you don't cheer, but, you know, some people do. Um, or, you know, whenever the bad guy's, like, just about to get to the person to kill him, all of a sudden, like, they, they get shot from behind, and the guy you thought was dead, like, popped up. Like, we love these last-minute heroic rescues. And the incredible thing is, is that our God in real life has done this from thousands of years ago till today and will be continuing to do real life, last minute, incredible rescues. And that's what I wanted to share with you today is this song, what inspired me, this song was, hey, I get to tell a whole bunch of awesome rescue stories. Done. Let's do it. And so uh, I want to dive into it. Um, first off, if you haven't heard the song, we're going to play it at the end. And I wanted to play it after the message because I want to talk about it first so that as we get into the song, it will really kind of bring it home at the end. Um, but in the song, she has uh, a couple of lyrics I want to focus on. First, she says this. Um, I hear the whisper underneath your breath. I hear you whisper, you have nothing left. And this is incredible because so many of us, this is a part of our story at some point in our lives. At some point in our lives, there has been a moment where we have just been broke, where we have just been done, where we have been praying, we have been hoping, we have been just, God, please do something. And in that last moment, just, I have nothing left. I, I, my, I can't fix my marriage. I don't know what's going on. I, uh, they, they are dying of cancer. Um, there, there's no hope here. I, I have this injury, and it's not going away. My kid, I can't fix it. I don't know what's happening. I, I, and we know, we feel these moments where it's just like, God, I have nothing left. And the beauty of this song is she writes it from God's perspective, speaking to us. And so this first, this crying out from our hearts, this whisper of just exhaustion, I think a lot of us associate with that. I think a lot of us can step back and say, I know that feeling. And maybe some of you, it's right now. Maybe some of you are in the battle right now that you're just going, I've just had enough. I'm just done. I've got nothing left. And what's incredible is our God of rescue, later in the song, he, she says this. She says, 
you're not defenseless. I'll be your shelter. I'll be your armor. And then she continues on. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true. I will rescue you. I will never stop marching to reach you in the middle of the hardest fight. And what's incredible about our God is when you read the Bible, this is what God does time and time again to desperate, hopeless people. He comes through in miraculous ways. Um, And he does this in in big, incredible ways. You you start with like um, Exodus 14 with Moses. Moses leads a million plus people out of Egypt defenseless. They have no weapons. They're just a a bunch of uh, Jewish people following Moses with no weapons or anything. And they reach the edge of the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, they turn around, and at a distance, they see the Egyptian army, the most well-trained, massive army in the world at that time, coming at them. Now, if you are standing there defenseless with your children, with your wives, and your husbands, and you're standing there, and you're going, what are, what are we supposed to do? God, what, why would you do that? Why would you bring us out here? We have no, no help. And here they come with their chariots and their swords and their arrows. What chance do we have? And in one of the most incredible rescue scenes ever, God literally opens a sea. And they walk across on dry land. And as they get to the other side, the Egyptians chase him into the sea. And Moses lowers his staff and the water crashes over them. And Moses has one of the most baller lines in all of scripture. In verse 13, people are freaking out. And Moses says this in verse 13. Do not be afraid. Stand firm. You will see the deliverance of the Lord that he will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. I mean, that is awesome. And sure enough, the water crashes over the Egyptians. The entire army is destroyed, and God rescues his people. But that's, that's just one. We, we can spend days here. But I want to tell you about Daniel in the lion's den. Another famous incredible rescue scene. You see, Daniel works for the king, and and the king is not a believer. Uh, uh, He's over in Babylon. They've captured God's people, and Daniel just serves the king. And the king really loves Daniel. And all of a sudden, the people that don't like Daniel trick the king. And they say, hey, anybody that worships another god, they, they get thrown into the lion's den, right? And he was like, yeah, yeah. And they said, Daniel did it. He worshiped his God. And the king's like, oh, I I love Daniel. And they're like, well, lion's den for him. And so the king is so heartbroken, and he, he takes Daniel, and they roll away a stone, and there's multiple lions inside this little den. And that's the punishment, is they throw you in there and close it, and you have all night in there. And whatever happens, happens. And so the king puts him in, and the king says, Daniel, pray to your God that he would rescue you. And they close it up, and the king can't sleep that night. And he runs first thing at the break of dawn to the, to the den, and he rolls away the stone, and he yells in there, Daniel, has your God rescued you? And Daniel says, yes, my king, he's rescued me. He came and he shut the mouths of the lion. And we see this incredible rescue story. Or you take uh, some of the most beautiful baby names that you could think of um, in the Bible. If you're, if you're looking, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, an incredible story. These three will not worship the, the false gods. And so King Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, you make me so angry, I'm going to throw you into a giant furnace. And he tells the people, crank the fire up seven times what it usually is. And it is so hot that the men that bind the three of them and walk them in to dump them into the fire, they die. It is so hot. Yet the three of them fall into the fire and the king is sitting there watching because he wants to watch them be tortured. And he looks in the fire and he goes, weren't there three men? And they say, yes, king. And he says, but I see four. And they say, yeah, there are four. And he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. And sure enough, they come out, and not one hair has been singed, not one part of their body hurt. And he says, truly, your God is the one true God. We see these incredible, miraculous, big ways that God saves us. But the incredible thing about our God is he doesn't just do the big, miraculous public things. He also, throughout the Bible, comes and does the intimate personal rescues too. And she says this in the song. She has a line that says, you are not hidden. There has never been a moment you were forgotten. You are not hopeless, though you have been broken. And sometimes that's how we feel too. 
Sometimes we just feel like, God, you just kind of blessed everybody else and forgotten me. God, everybody else has something going on, and I am hopeless. And, and there's stories in the Bible where we see this too. You take the story of Hagar. Uh, Hagar, she, she, um, she was a slave to Sarah, and Sarah couldn't have babies. So she sells her slave, Hagar, you're going to sleep with my husband, and you're going to have a child, and I'm going to claim it as mine, and, and that way I can have some children. And so she is forced to sleep with Abraham, and, and she gets pregnant, and immediately when she gets pregnant, Sarah hates her and, and starts mistreating her and beating her um, because she's angry that she got pregnant. And so eventually, once the baby comes, she's so hated and, and jealous uh, towards her that Sarah says, send her away. And so her and this young toddler are sent out into the wilderness with a little bit of water and food. And it gets so desperate. We were just in the desert of, of Utah not too long ago. I could not imagine sitting out there with a small child and no food or water. And yet that's where she's at, lost and alone in the wilderness, no food or water. And it says that she puts her child Ishmael under a bush and she goes far away so that she does not have to watch him die to of starvation. Can you imagine that desperateness? Can you imagine that pain that she's feeling? Of hearing her baby cry, knowing she has no way to help, and scooting far enough away because she just can't bear to listen to him cry and to watch him die. And in that moment, God comes and speaks to her and says, I've heard your cries. I've come to rescue you. Open your eyes. And there behind her is a well. And they have water, and they're saved. And, and God does this all throughout. You, you take, um, like, the widow. Um, Elijah comes to her, and it's during a great famine. And, and he says, hey, will you make me some bread and so, give me some water? And she said, I have this much flour and oil. I am going home to make one last meal for my son and I, and then we're going to die because we just have nothing. We're having our last meal. Can you imagine that desperateness, famine, of, of no rain for for three years it's going to be, um, and, and she says, we're going home to die. And Elijah tells her, no, 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 go ahead and make me some bread, and trust me, God will keep you providing. And sure enough, day after day, she uses and makes food, and there's still enough. And the next day she uses again, and there's still enough. The next day she uses again, and there's still enough. And God continually provides. How many of you have had a story like that, that in the middle of the month, you're sitting there going, oh, we're in trouble. Um, you know what, we're, we're doing ramen and SpaghettiOs for the rest of this month. Like, we're not going to make it. And then at the end of the month, you sit there and you go, we made it. Like, we didn't win the lottery make it, but like, we made it. How did that happen? God is a God of rescue and God is a God of provision. Or you take an incredible story like uh, in Mark chapter 5. There's a man who's possessed by demons, and, he, and he's so um, unruly, he, he, they try and chain him and bind him, and, and he, he breaks the chains, and he lives naked among the tombs. Can you imagine being so desperate that you are run out of town, and, and you know you are so vile and so hated and so dangerous that you live among the tombs, naked? And Jesus walks up to him, sends the demons out, and the people from the town come, and they see him in his clothes and in his right mind, and they go, whoa, you need to leave. You're freaking us out. And, and this man gets restored to life. He gets to be back a part of the community, rescued by God. But you know what? That's not even the most incredible rescue story in all the Bible. The most incredible rescue story in all the Bible is the story of Saul. Because the story of Saul goes like this. Uh, Saul would be uh, converted by God, and he changes his name to Paul. And so this is what Paul, Saul, says about himself. I am a Jew born in Tarshish of Sicilia, and I brought up in this city. I studied under Gamil and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors, just as zealous as God of any of you today. So he's telling this story, and he says, look, I am the Jew of Jews. I followed all the rules. I was all about our traditions, all about it, and I was so zealous for all of our traditions. He was so zealous that I persecuted the followers of the way. The way is what the people that followed Jesus immediately after Jesus rising called themselves. They called themselves the way. Um, and he said, I, I persecuted the, the people of the way. I, I, to their death, 
arresting both men. Later he would say he was there as Stephen was bludgeoned to death, encouraging them and holding cloaks so that people could beat him to death. And so he's saying, I, I persecuted people that believed in Jesus and followed Jesus. To their death, I arrested them. I arrested women. I arrested men. Um, I, I beat them. Um, he's saying, I was against everything Jesus was for. I attacked the church. And he said, I had letters to go to Damascus with names of people that were following Jesus there. And I was going there to stop them and beat them and arrest them. And then this happened. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all you have been assigned to do. And why this is the most incredible rescue story in all the Bible is this. Because God rescues Saul from hell. Persecuting the church and attacking the believers, imprisoning them, he was on a path to destruction and death. And God did what was ever necessary to break him from that path and rescue him from death. You see, God's greatest rescue story began at the very beginning of time with the fall of Adam and Eve, and it continues today and will continue into the future. God's greatest rescue story is us, his people, that he will stop at nothing to rescue you. God literally says, I am so desperate for you that I will do whatever it takes to get your attention. I will break whatever I have to break in your life. I will tear apart whatever I need to tear apart in your life. I will get your attention so that you will see that whatever you are trusting in, whatever you are hoping in, whatever you are, are living for that is not about me, I will tear it away from you so you see that I am most important. I, I tell this story all the time, but I love it. There was a, a mom, um, there was a boy I grew up with, and he was younger than me, and, and I knew him. We were acquaintances. But I ran into his mom one year um, when I was home, and I said, how's he doing? And she said, not good. He's into drugs. He's, he's gotten in trouble and stuff. And she said, every night I pray that God would knock him to his knees, however he does it that he would break him down. And I just pray that the rock that he trips on is not a big rock, that it's something he can recover from quickly. But I know he needs to be broken. I know he needs to be knocked onto his face. I know that this life has to fall apart. And so whatever God has to do to break through to him, that's what I pray for. And see, the beauty of God is this, that God is a God of rescue, and you are the object of that rescue. That if I were to sit down with each one of you, and you were to tell me your life from start to today, there are multiple stories of God changing outcomes, coming into your life, changing this, working in this, acting in this way, because he is actively rescuing you today. And he will not stop. He will pursue you to the ends of the earth. And even if you follow him today and you start to veer off that path, God says, I will stop at nothing to rescue you. And that's the beauty of the song that we're about to sing is that that is God's word to us, that there is nothing he will, that there is nothing that will limit him from pursuing you. That whatever it takes, he's coming for you. However big and monumentous the, the rescue has to be, he will do it. Because he loves you that much. Because he's a God of rescue. And he says this, uh, Paul says this in Romans 5. He says, you see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. God is actively rescuing you, and he sent his son to pay the price for you on the cross. And so I want to invite the, the band to come up at this time, um, and as they make their way up, I just want to encourage you in this, that you have a God who would lay down the life of his own son, who would sacrifice his own son to save you, to rescue you. And this God will not stop. There is no limits to how far he will go to break through to you, to save you from hell and to save you from death. 
He wants you with him forever. And so I want to invite you, we're going to stay seated. I want to invite you to just reflect on these words and to listen to what God has to say. not hidden it's never been a moment you were forgotten you are not hopeless though you have been broken your innocence stolen I hear you whisper underneath your breath So as your so Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, some of us are in need of rescue today. Some of us are really struggling. We're really struggling to hold on to hope. We're really struggling to trust, to believe that you can come through. Some of us are putting our hope in other things and putting our trust in ourselves, thinking we have to figure this all out, thinking it's all up to us. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for all the times that we doubt you, that we trust in other things, that we hope in other things. Forgive us for all the times that we just don't believe you'll come through. God, you are a God of rescue. You are a God who loves us and pursues us. So, Lord, let us see your glory. Let us see your majesty. Let us see your love. And forgive us for when we struggle to, to trust and believe. And all God's people said, 
Amen. Our God loves you, and he forgives you, and he understands what you're going through, and he knows it's tough. But the beauty of our God is that he says, no matter what you face, I have prepared a place. I have prepared a path. I have prepared my son to take on your biggest need, your biggest rescue. And so the beauty that I get to share with you is this, that upon your confession that you are a sinner, you are a person who struggles and is in need of forgiveness, that I get to announce to you that you are forgiven, that God has already prepared the place, He has already prepared the way, and you are forgiven. And no matter what struggle you're going through, no matter what doubts you're having, God is there and He's saying, I'm big enough and I can take your doubts on, I can take your challenges on, and I will come through. Trust me. Trust me. And He knows it's hard. That's why he gives Lauren Daigle a beautiful voice and gives her beautiful words to encourage you, to let you know that you can trust him. And so I want you to know that you are forgiven. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you are forgiven. Amen.